I'm Esther of Fashionomatic Off Grid. Today we're going to talk a little bit about our experiences living in a yurt. So this is our third winter in our yurt, which is 20 feet in diameter, 314 square feet, and self-built uh, from our own design, Nick's design, not mine, um, and from a lot of reclaimed materials. We thought this was a perfect time to share with you all the pros and cons of living in a yurt. So I had never heard of a yurt uh, until I was uh, living with my brother, shopping for land, and he said, maybe you guys should live in a yurt while you build your house. Um, and so I looked into it, and they were really pretty awesome uh, little structures. You could make it kind of anywhere. You could do it off-site, and uh, you could pack it up and travel with it and set it up relatively easily. I could put it in the back of my truck and bring it out here and set it up in uh, a day, which is pretty much how it went. We used a design principle where we divided the space into pie shapes. Rather than trying to divide our circle into squares, we tried to embrace the fact that it's a circle and make um, triangular wedge-shaped or pie-shaped areas for different purposes. So we have kind of a, a reading nook over here where we have some books. Yeah, can you show me where your books are? Um, right here with this some grown-ups. Um, up here, up there, with kids' books right here. We have our dirty area over here. This is where our dirty dishes go, and underneath the dirty dishes is our worm bin the trash, and the cat box, of course. And, yeah. and behind this, we actually have um, a shield that's protecting the Kana and the fabric behind the Kana from the splash. We built our yurt for right around $2,000. We were able to make it work uh, just by being thrifty and uh, really scanning Craigslist for free materials and used materials um, and really being committed to collecting enough stuff to make it work. The place where we actually spent money was on the skin and the insulation. Double bubble or Reflectix uh, insulation. It's bubble wrap with a foil face on two sides so it's not uh, immediately combustible. Um, and it works really pretty well. It's the thing to use in yurts. The other thing we spent money on was the, the skin. And we bought vinyl coated polyester new. Uh, and I did all the patterning myself and cut all of the pieces and then took it to a vinyl shop to be welded. Uh, so all of our seams on the exterior are all uh, welded. They're, you know, it's a heat process that sticks those two pieces of vinyl together and it's pretty bulletproof. I mean it's it's really held up well. I don't see any seams loosening up or coming apart and we've had zero leaks. So uh, I think that was a good place to put the money. One key to small space living for our family is that every person needs to have some space that can be their own where they can, they can feel like that space belongs to them. So it's important to us that our kids really have uh, tiny bedrooms, which is really just their bed. But you can see that Milo has his space completely made his own. He's, he's decorated it to the teeth with all of his stuff and exactly where it goes. And the girls are a little younger, but they've really decorated their space too. You can see they've got their, their special stuffed animals and things. Um. I have a my puffy pillow. I get to sleep it by the sleeping. She says she gets to sleep on her puffy pillow. Over here we have our dresser. The girls each have one drawer and Milo has two drawers just because his clothes got bigger. Um, and this is all pretty carefully arranged. The, the planning that goes into this um, is, is more than you might think to fit everything into a small space. It's kind of like doing a puzzle. So we have our clothing and our um, bathroom, 
our self-care area over here. And then we also have our toys. Our just potty trained child has a little potty here. The rest of us have to go down to the outhouse. And we really use the under bed storage. So for example, here's a drawer with Milo's pants in it. Uh, this, these drawers right here have grown up clothes in them. And if you get underneath the kids' bed, you'll find um, puzzle, puzzles and other toys. And a paper. And paper. Yep, this is where their coloring books and paper are. You can see this is this is the girls' toys. Sadie, you want to show us what's in there? Um, um right here is what you do push on is there when it goes the people dance. The people dance on it, yeah. Okay, tell me the parts of the yurt. Okay. So the yurt's made up of uh, the lattice work which makes the walls. It's called uh, the kana, I believe you say. Um, and it's this lattice work here. Um, that, is the, uh, that is the only structure in the walls that carries the entire roof load and everything. But it's also thin, so it's flexible enough to make the curve of the footprint. Uh, and it's held together by uh, fasteners that are able to pivot. So if you can imagine like a, like a baby gate or some other uh, accordion folding thing, uh, this whole, our 60 some feet of uh, perimeter folds down into, <coughs> uh, I think it's about six feet of width uh, when it's all packed together. And then there's rafters. The rafters all tie into one central ring um, up at, at, in the top, and then the rafters come down and they sit on the, the kana, the lattice work. Uh, a lot of our rafter work and uh, even our ring and everything is all covered up by insulation now. So if you're wondering what, this, uh, what makes the wall so cute underneath the kana, we put on thrift store sheets just for fun. We just thought that would be a cute way to have a sort of instant wallpaper. And then on the other side of those sheets, there's more of the double bubble insulation before you get to the heat sealed canvas on the outside. Do you think we would ever, if we had to do this again, do lower air intakes? Yeah, I think that, I think that it would help to have uh, air intakes sort of low on the wall um, to, to pull in cooler air. And, and get the circulation happening all the way from the floor uh, up to the ceiling. Um, what a lot of people do with yurts uh, for cooling is they open up the top and then actually hike up the, the fabric of the... Ours is a little more of a permanent uh, installation, so it, it wasn't feasible for us to do that. But um, having the two windows is, has been a pretty good solution for airflow. So the yurt has been very successful in being an economical and efficient way to get ourselves a shelter. And it's actually been a fun, creative way to live for me and Nick to use our belongings yeah. as decoration. Um, it's easy to put a hook anywhere on the Kana and you can see that pretty much everything we own and use every day is visible. That's what our decorations are made of. Would you recommend a yurt to another family? Uh, I would recommend a yurt to other families. Uh, I think our family is getting a little bit big for a 20-foot yurt, um, but that's why we're building a house. Um, for people who are able to um, deal with a, a tiny house situation, then, um, then yeah, it's a, it's a great affordable way to do it. It would probably be a lot easier to deal with in a climate that's a little more mild um, but it's really um, relatively easy to do and uh, has been really pretty much maintenance free and um, uh, it was a really good short path for us to have shelter. to share with you that I have an article in a magazine called Molly Green, which is a great magazine if you are into homesteading, homemaking, 
homeschooling. They also have a section for home industry. This is the first time that I've been in this magazine and it is an article about yurts. So if you're looking for more information about our yurt experiences, a little bit more detail maybe, or telling the story in my voice, I'll put that link below. Thanks for watching. I'm Esther from Fouchomatic Off Grid. I'm Nick. Thanks for coming to our yurt. Yoda, my cat is.